so we are now broadcasting live on Periscope. Can I introduce Bam. you? Oh, sure. everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Ranger Susan from Hello. Springfield Armory. And the voice that you hear is Stacy Schmeidel. I am trying to broadcast live on Periscope. Thank you for being here. And we're going to get started shortly. Um, in the meantime, thanks for your patience. And here's a view of the opening slide. So all you need to do is aim this at the screen, and that should be ready. Okay. And it's broadcast. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Preservation Trust. Oh, 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 okay. Thank, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Right. All right. And what about from Stacy? <laughs> yeah. Looks like we have a mixed crowd here. Excellent. Well, does anybody know what week this is? Fair Earth week. What is it? Earth week. Earth week. Yeah. National Park Week. Yes. Yeah. National Park Week. And I couldn't have thought of a better person to do a program than Stacy for National Park Week and her bears. So by day, she does PR marketing for Smith College. And then when any other time she has, she does PR for the brown bears. So whenever I first met Stacy, um, actually our volunteer, Roger, who is here, went to a nerd night program. And Stacy was given her a program on the brown bears. And I don't think uh, Roger was barely home when he was emailing me saying, you've got to have this program at the Armory. So I was really excited because we highlight so many other programs here, but not so much national park programs. And so I thought it was a perfect fit for National Park Week for Stacy to be here with us. Um, let's see, and Joanne said I'd forget a lot of stuff, which uh, I probably will. Mm -hmm. So uh, Stacy has been a volunteer. She volunteers with us at the, the Big E, but she also volunteered six weeks at Catbite, and I think that's when her romance with the bears uh, started, <laughs> uh, working the bear camps. So I think we're in for a real treat uh, today. This has been the most tech-savvy program <laughs> I think we've ever had here at the Armory. So on that note, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Stacey Schmeidel. So thank you, Ranger Susan. Thank you all for being here, and happy National Park Week. Um, I have given this talk before, or versions of this talk before, 
but to be invited to give the talk in this space in the, Nash in the Springfield Armory National Historic Site as part of National Park Week, this is like my dream come, come true. Great. So yes. thank you for being part of that. And I want to thank Saint, uh, Ranger Susan and, uh, for extending the invitation, Ranger Roger for suggesting it. Um, and I want to thank them not just for the invitation, but for everything that they do every day. Uh, National Park Rangers are my heroes. Um, so thank you for everything that you do. I'm going to try to talk for about 35 minutes today and then leave time for questions at the end, lots of questions. I'm also happy to stick around and take private questions when it's all over. Um, I want to say up front, if you need to leave at any point um, to make a comfort stop or get a drink of water or just cool off, please feel free to come and go as needed. Um, I'm told that this room can get warm, so you do what you need to do. Um, I also have a couple of housekeeping things just at the beginning. Um, I, I have been, I was given the best gift in the world this summer. I got to spend six weeks in Katmai National Park, Alaska, which is where a place that people dream of going. And, um, I can't believe that I got to go there. And this was a gift from the universe. So, um, part of my way of repaying that gift is by sharing the experience with everybody who I can. So I'm going to pass around my business cards. I want to be able to share my, my slides with anybody who needs them. If you want my slides, uh, send me an email. My email address is on my business cards. If you have questions, just send me an email. Um, I'm also going to send, out, or send around something that is completely optional, which is this sign-up sheet. Um, I am not going to spam you with email. But if you want to get an email from me when the, uh, once a year when the bear cam goes live, um, feel free to write your name and your email address here. Also, if you want information about Katmai National Park, write your, e uh, write your mailing address down here or see me afterwards. And I, can, I have some Katmai brochures at home that I could send to you. So I'll send both of those things around. Um, come on in. Oh, come on in. And if, my, if I'm not loud enough, if you can't hear me at the back, will you raise your hands and wave or something? And if I'm too loud at the front, just kick me, okay? Um, oh, and we are trying to do a live stream. So if, um, once we get to the Q&A at the end, if you do not want to be on the live stream, let me know and we'll pull the plug, okay? <laughs> oh, and welcome everybody who's here through the live stream. Um, the reason I wanted to do the live stream is that there are about 1,500 bear cam viewers who are avidly interested in anything to having to do with the cat high bears. Um, so we are hoping that some of them are joining us here today. We've got so 15, hi, 15 people on Periscope so far. Wow. Cool. Uh -huh. Excellent. Wow. 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 So um, I, I always start this talk by uh, saying thank you. I want to say thank you to Smith College for letting me go to a land where there is no cell phone access, no internet access, <laughs> letting me take 30 days of accumulated vacation time to spend in Bush, Alaska. I want to thank the National Park Service for everything that they do at Katmai, here at the Springfield Armory, and at national parks around the world. I want to thank Mike Fitz, who is a former ranger at Katmai, and he now works for Explore.org. And I want to thank all of the Katmai Rangers. Anything that I say that is right today is because I learned it from them. Anything that I get wrong is my own fault. Um, and I want to thank Explore.org because without them, I would not know anything about the bears. And also Mar Maurice Whalen, who was a volunteer at the same time as me, uh, and who was an excellent photographer, which I am not. And I also put this slide up front because this is my post most important slide. And I used to leave this till last, and I would always forget to show it. So my hope is that by the end of this talk, you will have tons of questions. And when you have those questions, these are the places to go for more information. And I'll try to remember to put this slide up at the end again. Um, and it, but again, if you want any of this, I'll email it to you. Okay, so let's start the formal talk. Um, what I want to do today is talk to you a bit about Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'll talk in particular about the place where I was, which is Brooks Camp, which is a section of Katmai. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the volunteer work that I did as a, a visitor assistant for interpretation. And then I want to introduce you to some bears. And then we'll take questions. But let's start with a question to all of you. What do you think of when you imagine a bear? Big. 
Big. What else? A loving and um, protective mother. Oh, loving and protective mother. Interesting. Thank you. What else? You're not supposed to run. No, no, no. Don't run. Good tip from the ranger. Thank you. They're Anything hungry. else? They're hungry. They're hungry. They, thank you. Gosh, you guys are setting up my talk perfectly. Raiding the trash barrels in the parks. Raiding the trash barrels in the park. That's great. I'm so glad you said that. Up in Yellowstone, I remember. Yellowstone. <laughs> also in our own backyards. Yeah, that's true. true. How do you feel when you imagine a bear? Scared? Excited. Happy. Excited? Happy? Yeah, excited. Goose flesh. Goose flesh? All legit feelings. I am somebody who never thought about bears at all until 2013. And I never had feelings about bears until 2013. And then in 2013, somebody sent me, a friend of a friend, who I never met, sent me this link, which I hope will come up on video. Um, she sent me a link to the explore.org bear cams. Does anybody watch the bear cams? Leslie watches the bear cams. The kids kind of watch the bear cams. Um, so I have it. I've seen the link here. I don't know if this is going to come up. Ah, we might not have video yet. So we've been talking about our first technical challenge. So we're not going to have video for this talk, which is totally okay. Um, she sent me a, li a link to the explore.org bear cams, and these are webcams that brought, I can live without the video, it's okay. Um, and I saw something that looks like this. Oh, wow. But instead of seeing a photograph, I saw live video from Alaska of all of these bears and more sitting in a river catching fish. <laughs> And I was hooked. Um, I could not stop watching. Six years later, I am still watching. Um, what you see when you watch the live cams, and there are, I think now, seven cams that broadcast live from Katmai National Park from late June until October. And what you see are dozens of bears gathered at a waterfall. So I want to ask you, when I said, what do you think of when you imagine a bear? Did anybody imagine this? Hungry, eating salmon. They're hungry and they're eating salmon. <laughs> and I fell in love with this, and it was fascinating to me, because if you watch during July, which is when I started watching, you will see these bears eating, you'll see these bears catching fish, you'll, you'll see the bears mating, you'll see dominance behavior. Um, later in the season, once the bears get full, you'll see the bears playing with each other for half an hour at a time. And the thing that really fascinated me when I started watching in 2013 is that you would see these bears lined up at the waterfall like this. And there was one bear in particular, and any time that bear walked in, he would come in down the, down the hill on the other side of the river, and any time that bear walked in, all the other bears started moving around. <laughs> And before he, the, this, the big bear even hit the water, every other bear would kind of disperse. And the bear who was sitting here would move over there. And then that bear would move over there. And then that bear would ping over there. And it was like a ballet or um, like an aerial view of a, a football game. Um, and I could tell that something was happening. I could tell that there was a pattern to all of this <coughs> movement. But I, didn't, I couldn't see what the pattern was. So I started watching the cams and trying to figure out what was going on with that movement. And I started um, not only watching the cams, but participating in the comments chat underneath the live stream video. Oh. And I started watching the ranger chats. The rangers would come on, you know, a couple times a week, three or four times a week, and they would talk about what was happening on the cams. And I started watching that obsessively. Um, and then after two or three years of watching the cams, I thought, well, heck, I'm spending all my life watching the cams. Um, and I volunteered to become a camera operator for Explore.org. Explore.org has webcams in parks and other uh, beautiful locations all over the world. These cams are operated by volunteers all over the world um, from our homes. So I started doing that. Um, I'm in my third year now as a cam op. 
And then I learned that, uh, you, that Katmai National Park also hires volunteers. Um, and I want to talk more about volunteering, so I hope that somebody will ask me a question in the Q&A <laughs> about volunteering, because I, I have a lot to say about that. Um, so I heard that Katmai hired volunteers. I applied. I went through a, a phone interview, and I was one of four people who were hired to be a volunteer at Katmai last July, so July 2018. They also hired two people to be there in September. Let me tell you a bit about Katmai National Park and Preserve. Has anybody been to Katmai? Ooh, one. Excellent. And were you? where were you at Katmai? I'm, I'm not sure. I, no, I was <laughs> fishing. They flew me in <laughs> in a float plane. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic experience. Katmai is immense. Katmai National Park and Preserve is 4.2 million acres. It's huge. It's huge. Um, to get there, uh, and Katmai, you can see on this map, is located down here. It's about 300 miles south of Anchorage, Alaska. So to get to Katmai, you fly to Anchorage, and then you fly from Anchorage to, a to I flew from a place called Anchorage to King Salmon. And then if you're going in as a, uh, as a park guest, as a tourist, you would probably uh, fly on a float plane from King Salmon or someplace else, land on Naknek Lake. I actually uh, went in by boat, but most people uh, come in and land on that back lake. I want to point out that uh, Katmai is located just to the left of Katmai over here is a place called Bristol Bay. Has anybody heard of Bristol Bay? What do we know about Bristol Bay? Salmon. Salmon fishing. Salmon. Millions of salmon, tens of millions of salmon. It is the, it is the home of one of the world's best and greatest natural, it is, it, it is one of the world's best and greatest natural salmon fisheries. It is also the, the site of the proposed pebble mine. So when you think about salmon, when you think about bears, think about Bristol Bay. Bristol Bay matters. Um, I said that Katmai was immense. It's 4.2 million acres. I spent six weeks in uh, an area that's about two miles wide and two miles up and down. <laughs> I did take one little field trip, but mostly I saw, a, a, you know, mostly I was, I was at a place called Brooks Camp. Um, and this is a map of Brooks Camp. Remember those, uh, those salmon that are coming out of Bristol Bay? Uh, in July 2018 when I was there, I think these numbers are correct, there were 6.2 million salmon that came out of Bristol Bay in July. Two million of those salmon swam up the Naknek River to um, spawn. They wound, some of those salmon wound up here in Naknek Lake, which is part of Brooks Camp. Brooks Camp is important because you can see that there's this river. Brooks Camp is built around the Brooks River, which is only a mile and a half long. But over the course of July, 400,000, 500,000 salmon swam up the Brooks River. That's a lot of salmon, you yes, guys. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, in the Brooks River, they, well, I'll get there in a minute. Um, this is not the Brooks River. <laughs> this is the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, which is also part of Katmai National Park. This is the one place in Katmai that I went to that wasn't technically at Brooks Camp. The reason I have this picture up here is that Katmai National Park was established as a national monument in 1918. I was there during the centennial. Oh. Yeah, very special. And the reason that Katmai was established as a part of the national park system had nothing to do with bears. If you look at the documentation, bears are not even mentioned. Instead, it focused on the volcanoes. And this is the land of 10,000 smokes. That's where it gets its name. Yeah. And if you ever have a chance to go to Katmai, if you ever have a chance to go to Brooks Camp, I encourage you to take the tour. There's a day-long tour. You leave at 8.30 in the morning. You get home at 3.30 in the afternoon. And you get to go out to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes to see the volcanoes. But today, Katmai is known for the bears. And it is, in fact, one of the world's best uh, wildlife viewing destinations. Not only for bears. You can also see lynx and moose. Um, there was a wolf who was hanging out when I was there. But most people go to see the bears. 
And the reason that the bears wind up at Brooks Camp is that you have that mile and a half long river with 500,000 salmon swimming upstream. And about halfway up the river, they encounter this waterfall. They encounter Brooks Falls. So the salmon get hung up there at the falls. And the bears have a feast. So it is a plentiful and reliable food source for, for the bears who can make, who choose to make their living in this location. It is not unusual uh, in July to see 20 or 30 bears fishing the waterfall. And this year, I believe that the official bear monitor counted 50 separate bears who came to fish the, the waterfall during July. It's amazing. What, came, what makes Brooks Camp special? Like everything. <laughs> So first of all, there's Brooks Falls, which again is a, a it provides plentiful food for bears in July, and it's a great place to see bears. But Brooks Camp is special not only in July. Something that's kind of unusual. Uh, this is the lower river, so this is where the river meets Naknek Lake, down. So the, so the waterfall would be up here. This is the lower river in fall. In July, people come to, to Brooks Camp to see the big bears fishing the waterfall. In September, what happens is all of those salmon who have swam upstream in July, in September those salmon die. And they all start flowing down, floating down the Brooks River. And they wind up here in the lower river near Naknek Lake. So Brooks Camp winds up be, being a great place to see bears in July and a great place to see bears in September. It's also special because of the cams. So these cams, I think, were installed in 2013. They are a, kind of a, a really amazing partnership between Katmai National Park and an organization called Explore.org. Explore.org is a philanthropic organization that was started by Charlie Annenberg. And I think I mentioned earlier that he has set up, it's the world's largest network of nature cams. So they have cams in Africa. Uh, they have cams uh, in Saskatchewan looking at bison. They have um, horse sanctuaries and cat sanctuaries, national parks. It's kind of incredible. Um, and the cams, as an interpretive device, I think are really amazing because what the cams allow us to do, they've got cams in different locations. So you, if you go to the park, you're going to stand in one location, maybe two or three or four locations, and you're going to watch very intensively from that look. You're going you're gonna to see the park through that lens. But if you watch the cams, you can theoretically watch the cams for 12, 16, 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> and you could theoretically watch the cams seven days a week, four months of the year. Not that anybody would do that. <laughs> But what that allows us to do is see these bears and see the stories of these bears play out over time. So you can watch a bear that maybe you know comes in one day and has an injured paw or a broken leg, and then two months later you'll see the same bear and he won't even have a limp. And you can watch these bears. There are some bears who we have seen from the time that they were born to now their subadult lives. We've seen bears move from cubhood to subadulthood, from teenage subadulthood or teenagerhood through adult life. We've seen bears die on the camps. So it's a really um, kind of amazing way of getting to know bears and their stories. And this works at Katmai. It works like this. And I know that different. I've never been to other national parks in Alaska. Um, but I think that they work differently. So um, there's a place called uh, McNeil Bear Sanctuary where 10 people go. Ten, you have to apply by lottery. They admit 10 people per day. You can get very close to the bears because you're, there's only 10 people in the park and you're with a guide at all times. And then there's Denali where I think you spend maybe most people see the wildlife from a bus. Yeah. And I, I always think of Katmai as being someplace in the middle. Katmai works because the, we train people to behave appropriately. So when you land on a lake, you will be greeted on the beach by a bunch of bears and probably by a volunteer who will lead you to the visitor center immediately for your mandatory bear orientation. And 
<laughs> and the, in the bear, bear orientation, they're going to go through the rules. Um, the, the, the thing about Katmai is that you are in a kingdom of bears and a queendom of bears. Bears are king in Katmai. So we respect them and we do things to keep them safe. So, for example, you never carry food. Um, you eat food at Katmai only in a hard sided building or in the picnic area behind uh, an electric fence. Um, you're encouraged to hike in groups rather than by yourself. Um, because if you're in a group, then you chat, you talk, and then bears hear you, and they'll, they'll stay away. And, they'll, and you also get training on what to do if you encounter a bear on a trail. And basically the training is, get out of the bear's way. <laughs> and here's how you do that. You do not run. As Ranger said, you're not going to run. Um, you're going to back up. And if the bear follows you, you're going to yield the trail. You're going to get close. You're going to form a group with the people who you're hiking with. Um, I want to say that the last time somebody was hurt at Katmai was, I think, in the 1980s. Um, there was a family that was walking up the Brooks Falls Trail to go watch bears, and uh, there was a bear that was being chased by another bear, and those two bears came barreling down the trail um, and knocked over the, the child with, that was with the family. Um, he was not hurt badly. The last time a bear was hurt at Katmai was in the 1970s, and that was a bear named Sister Bear. And uh, one of the big rules is, at Katmai is that they don't want the bears to ever associate people with food. Uh -huh. And something happened, I don't know how this happened, but somehow Sister Bear uh, became, came to associate uh, people with food. Somebody gave her a food reward. And within a few days, she was, you know, trying to get into cabins, and um, she knew that people meant food, and so she had to be um, killed. Oh. And if you go to Katmai, in the visitor center, they still have her pelt over the um, rafters in the orientation room, and just as a reminder. One of the things that I hope you take away from this talk, as the opening slide said, people can live with bears. Um, we just have to get over our, our ideas about them, our wrong ideas about them. At Katmai, sorry, I got off topic. At Katmai, there's no buses, um, and you, you can get close to bears. Um, the primary way that you see bears at Katmai is from these elevated viewing platforms. And there are three or four, depending on how you count them, viewing platforms right along the river. There's one viewing, viewing plat platform that's at, right up next to the waterfall, there's another at the Riffles, which is in the middle of the river. And then there's a, another platform plus an annex down here at the lower river. And you'll see these people are watching the bears over there, but this little guy is down here. <laughs> there are bears everywhere. Um, and it is not unusual at all to encounter a bear on the beach when your plane lands or to encounter a bear on the trail while you're walking to one of the viewing platforms. It's magical. My job... There's lots of different kinds of rangers in the Park Service. Um, and at Katmai, some of the rangers who I met, there's law enforcement rangers. Um, there are, at Katmai, there's bear management rangers. Their job is to kind of keep the people and the bears separate. Um, there's people who do maintenance. There's people who work at, the, at Brooks Lodge uh, providing food and housing. Um, then there are interpretive rangers. And that was kind of, I was a visitor assistant for interpretation. And what interpretation means, basically, as Ranger Susan said, I felt like I was doing PR for the bears. Um, and basically, I talked to people about bears for eight hours a day. Um, this is not an asset in my real life. Most people do not want to listen to me talk about bears for eight hours a day. Right, Alex? Um, <laughs> but if you like talking about bears... You'll love volunteering at Katmai National Park, because that's what you get to do. You get to answer questions about the bears. I want to talk more about volunteering. Um, I want to talk more about um, my partic the particulars of my volunteer job. So somebody should ask me about being a cam op in the Q&A, and somebody should ask me about what, it, what volunteering is like. I'll give you the overview. Um, I usually start by saying, when you imagine a bear... Most of us think of bears as solitary creatures, right? We're used to seeing, maybe, maybe you see a mom and cubs, right? 
But you don't think about groups of 10 or 12 big male bears hanging out together. We think of bears as being solitary creatures. And I believe that the reasons bears are solitary creatures is that they lead really difficult lives. Bears have one job, eating, getting fat. But the thing is, they only have six months out of the year to do it, right? Um, these bears at Katmai emerge from the den in April. They go back into the den in October. So they have a summer, essentially, to do a year's worth of living. Yeah. So there's an intensity to their lives that I find quite, I think part of the reason I get so, so excited about them is that they live so intensely. And their job is to get fat. The, I forgot to say, these bears at Katmai, we're not talking about the black bears that we see here in New England. We're talking about Alaskan brown bears. Um, these bears are with the bears of Kodiak Island, some of the biggest bears in the world. So a female bear um, at Katmai, the female bears that I ran into probably came up to here. I'm 5'6", probably 5'7 in these shoes. Um, and the female bears that I ran into probably came up to here. The subadult <coughs> male bears that I ran into came up to about here. And the larger male bears, which thank goodness I never ran into, would have been higher, taller than that. And that's walking on all fours. I believe, and I may get these numbers wrong, I believe that female bears at Katmai can be between 300 and 600 pounds. Male bears might be between 600 and 900 pounds. And there are some male bears that I bet are close to 1,000. Um, so bears have one job, that's to get fat. And they get fattest during salmon season. When they come out of their dens in April, they will have lost during hibernation, they will have lost one third of their body weight. And so they come out of the den hungry. But the thing is, there aren't salmon when they come out of the den. So for the first <coughs> month or so after they come out of the den, they're going to subsist on sedge grass. Um, and maybe, you know, if they can find anything else that they can find, uh, a dead caribou or something. But in at the end of June, magic <coughs> begins to happen at Brooks Camp. And that's when the, all of those salmon start swimming upstream out of Bristol Bay, up the Naknek River, up the Brooks River to the Brooks Falls. And on the days that I worked outside, my job was to stand on that Brooks Falls platform or on the Riffles platform and talk to people about what they were seeing. And usually the conversation went something like this. Somebody would say, a guest would say, oh my god, I've been watching that bear up on top of the waterfall. I've been watching that bear for 10 minutes, and I've been timing him. He's caught a fish every 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> true, it's true. Yeah. Um, and, the, and, this, and the guest would say, no wonder that bear up on top of the waterfall is the dominant bear. And I would say, oh, that bear up on top of the waterfall? That's bear 409 bead nose. And she's a 20-year-old female, <laughs> and she just emancipated her most recent litter of cubs, and you can see them fishing down there. Um, and yes, she is amazing. Girl power. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and then the next question would be, oh, the bear up on the top of the waterfall, that's not the most dominant bear? If the bear on the top of the waterfall isn't the most dominant bear, then where does the most dominant bear sit? Does anybody know where the most dominant bear sits? Anywhere he wants. Anywhere he wants. <laughs> you guys are a good audience. <laughs> and usually where the most dominant bear sits is down here in the jacuzzi. Oh. Um, and the reason is this. These bears aren't just kind of plopped down in random locations. These bears find places to sit where the fish get caught up. So maybe there's a log or maybe there's an eddy. You know, that's the, where, the, where the water swirls around because of the rocks. Here at the jacuzzi, and you can't see it well in this picture, but what happens here at the jacuzzi is that the fish try to leap up the waterfall right where those two bears are standing. You see a lot of salmon trying to leap right there. So you get bears positioning themselves up at the top to catch the salmon in their mouth, like for an, for an IV nose does. And you also get the dominant bear sitting here in the jacuzzi. And the reason is that in the jacuzzi, there's a video online of the rangers getting into the jacuzzi. If you tried to get into this jacuzzi, you'd probably be knocked over. You have to have a lot of, a lot of core strength <laughs> to hold your own in the jacuzzi. 
the, the water is swirling around like this. And you also to have to have established yourself ahead of time as a dominant bear. You have to be willing to say, uh -uh, you're not coming in here. This is my spot. And the reason the dominant bear wants to fish there is that there's a lot, there's a lot of salmon that jump up in that location. They get knocked back. They get swirled around in the jacuzzi. And they get kind of confused. And so if you're big enough and strong enough to hold your own in that location, it's a great place to fish. And that story that I told at the beginning about the bear coming in and displacing all the other bears, that's kind of what happens. So that bear was bear 856, and he would walk in down there. He likes to fish the jacuzzi. If 856 comes in to fish the jacuzzi, then 747 has to get out. 747 is going to go fish in the far pool, which means that bear 83 has to go someplace. <laughs> and it's like this whole domino thing. It's fascinating. Did somebody just say, so, yes, so this is bear 409B nose. How do you know who's who? This is bear 409B nose. I think I heard somebody say, she looks like a young bear. How do you know this is 409? Well, it's easy. She's kind of cinnamon colored. She's kind of petite. Uh, a lot of people, when they first see her, they think that she's a, a subadult bear or a small bear. But she is, in fact, an, a grown female of 20 years old. Um, you can see she has neon blonde ear tips. Uh, you can kind of see in this picture, if you, if, once you start watching the cams, she has a, a, pro, she has a very distinctive profile. She has a nose like a ski jump. So that's bear 409B nose. You say 20 years old. What's average lifespan? Thank you for wild? asking that. So it depends. Um, for females, uh, females at Katmai live longer than males. Males live to be about, uh, usually about 15. Females usually live into their 20s. Is that what takes them out? Is it just a swim? I, so or, or is it like sickness? Or like yeah, so, um, so there's a, being a bear is really hard. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of things that cause bear deaths. Um, so, and I'll talk more specifically about cub death later. Um, famine, uh, lack, of, lack of fat resources. If they don't get fat enough going into the den, uh, you, have to, you have to get fat enough to, to live off your fat stores for six months. Um, so lack of, a, a bad salmon run could be bad. If you break a bone, if you break a leg, then you might not be able to fish. Bears kill other bears. Um, you might uh, die coming down the mountain in a fall. It's um, and we and and I'll talk later about a bear named uh, 451 who lost one of her cubs. That cub died on on cam, and uh, because the cub died on cam after the park was closed, the rangers were able to retrieve the cub's body and have it autopsied, and that bear was found to have died of canine adenovirus. Huh. Yeah, exactly. Which apparently uh, is a naturally occurring thing in bears and other animals. So it must be infectious. It is infectious. It's transmissible by, through body fluids. Um. So here's bear 409B nose, petite, kind of a long neck, cinnamon colored. Blonde ears. Blonde ears. <laughs> well, who's this? <laughs> Blonde ears. <laughs> That's bear 409B nose. Oh, the same bear? That's the same bear. Look at the no. yeah. no. This is her on June 29th, 2018. Oh, this is the end of the summer. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, that oh, is. Oh, my girl. Look at her. Isn't she fabulous? <laughs> These bears, the Katmai bears, will gain 50% of their body weight between June and the time they go into the den. So if a bear, and I'm totally making this up, if 409 bead nose comes out of the den, uh, arrives at Brooks Camp weighing 300, 300 pounds, she might weigh 450 pounds going in. You can see, too, that her, her, the color of her coat has changed. Right. Completely different color. Um, you, somebody said you, you can see her blonde ear tips. Yeah. Um, and you could, you could see her nose. You can't see it in that picture, no. but that profile is a good way to look. Mm -hmm. These bears look completely different at the end of the season than they do at the beginning of the season. So when I said that IDing bears was easy, totally lying. IDing bears is really hard. Yeah, I bet. Did the sun do that to her hair? 
<laughs> it's all natural. <laughs> this is for this is her in 2015, beginning of season, end of season. Oh, this is Bear 480 Otis. He's he's the oldest male that frequents Brooks Camp. That's him at the beginning of 2015 and him at the end of 2015. He would have been about 20 years old at that time. <laughs> this is this is Bear 747 in August of last year. Every year, Katmai National Park sponsors something called Fat Bear Week. Have you all, have you all seen Fat, Fat Bear Week? So this is a thing that happens on social media, and it's, it's starting to get quite a lot of media coverage. They create brackets where they, <laughs> like the NCAA tournament, and the Rangers pick bears. It's, it's horrible. They, they pit the bears against each other, and they say, who's fatter? Who's gotten fatter? 409 Bead Nose or 480 Otis? This is Bear 747 at the end of the season. One of the great injustices perhaps, of last year, is that Bear 747, who ended the season even bigger than this, did not win Fat Bear Week. Why? Why? Because 409 Bead Nose won Fat Bear Week. Uh, <laughs> um, this is quite controversial. I say that in a joking way. Um, the way that Fat Bear Week works is that people go on Facebook and they cast their votes. And so, you know, some people try to be really scientific about it, but some people vote for the bear that they like. The cutest, the cutest bear. So it's not meant to be scientific, but it is a great way to help get people interested in the bears and help get people excited about the bears and help people learn about the bears. So poor 747 did not win. So IDing bears is difficult. They... They, they gain a lot of weight, their coats change color, they look completely different in, in August or September than they do in, in June or July. So how do you know who's who? Do you notice anything about this bear on the left? It's hard to see in this picture. Do you, can you see anything special about her neck? It looks like she's wearing a collar. She's not wearing a collar, but this bear, this is bear 854 Divot, uh, and this is her with one of her cubs a few years ago. And when you see Bear 854 Divot, she always looks like she's wearing a collar or a choker. Huh. And the reason she looks that way is that that's a scar. Okay. And the reason she has a scar that looks like that is because, I think it was uh, in 2013, I think, Bear 854 Divot was spotted about 10 miles from Brooks Camp with a wolf snare around her head. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, she was seen. They saw her. She had a cub at the time. And the National Park Service, uh, you know, if a bear is injured, park policy is not to intervene. Let nature take its course. Unless the injury is human caused. Yeah, that was uh, Right. The wolf snare is not nature. And she was spotted in August with, with the wolf snare around her neck. She had been seen in July with two cubs. She was spotted in August with one cub and with a wolf snare around her neck. And it was August, so she had not reached maximum weight, and that snare was tied around her neck. So the National Park Service made a decision to try to remove the wolf snare. And there is a fascinating video on, online, if you Google 854 divot wolf snare, um, it's an hour long video. Finding a bear in August, especially a bear with a cub, um, Finding a bear, just locating her in the vast expanse of Katmai National Park in August, because by this time they had moved away from the waterfall. The salmon had gone upstream. They had followed the salmon upstream. Um, so they were wandering around, I think it was near Margot Creek, and uh, they had to bring in a bear expert to give her the right dose of anesthesia, give her enough anesthesia to make her fall asleep but not harm her. They had to find her in a location where she would fall asleep, not in a river, you know. Um, and they had to, to deal with the cub, who was wide awake during the whole operation. Um, so there's a fascinating video. This I think it took three days. It took several attempts in a couple of days. But they were able to remove the wolf snare. And today, she is one of the most easily recognizable bears <laughs> yes. because, of that that, because of that scar. Another way that you can recognize bears, another thing that helps with bear ID, so scars are good, things like uh, profiles that, you know, the, the uh, ski jump nose. Some bears have white claws, 
A very few bears have white claws. So that's a good ID trick. Um, another, but the best way really to tell is by personality and pattern. Um, so I know, you can't see it in this picture, one of my favorite bears is Bear 89 Backpack. He has no scars, no tattoos, no piercings. Um, he likes to fish in the far pool, and he likes to perch on rocks. And when he fishes in the par far pool, he kind of he has a very distinctive motion where he kind of slap paws the water. And so if I see a bear fishing in the far pool, slap pawing the water with his left hand, with left, left paw, hand. <laughs> I think, oh, is that Bear 89 backpack? Bear 409 B dose, who likes to fish the lip, she often will, uh, she'll stand on the lip and she'll, you know, she'll kind of perch herself on the lip and she likes to fish, like, she looks like a, a pointer dog. Mm. She kind of, you know, she lifts up her paw like this. There's another bear that likes to fish the lip. His name is, uh, he's uh, 775 Lefty. He's a big male bear and he likes to fish the lip. And he'll stand like this and he does this when he fishes. <laughs> and that's one way to tell that it's bear 775 Lefty. There is a new bear who just started fishing the lip this year. I think it's bear 812. He's a young bear. This is his first year fishing the lip. And I'm, I'm not making this up. When he fishes the lip, he stands like this. He bounces up and down. And he holds his left paw out like this. It looks like he's trying to catch a calf. <laughs> but I seriously wonder, I mean, to me, his fishing style with the bouncing and with the lifted paw, I mean, he does this. He, he's, he's not as elegant as 409B does, but he's got that paw up in the air. And I seriously wonder if that's kind of a combo of 775 and 409. Because bears learn from watching other bears. Oh, um, they Yes, so scars and patterns and personalities, those are the real clues to bears, bear ID. These bears are not collared, and these bears are not tagged, but the park does keep track of individual bears. So you've heard me talking about bear 775, bear 480. Um, once a bear has been seen on its own, separate, separate from its mom, three times during a prescribed viewing period, by the official bear monitor, um, that bear is eligible to earn a number. A number, I win it. Right. And some bears also get nicknames. Nicknames are kind of controversial, and I think there might be a trend moving away from nicknames. And the reason for that is like, okay, so there was a bear named 814 Lurch, and if you know a bear's name Lurch, what do you think of him? <laughs> Klutzy. Yeah, Klutzy or Big, right? Yes? Why, why just the numbers? I mean, if we're trying to get people to learn more about them and know more about them and sort of maybe relate to them more, wouldn't it be better to have names? So, and that, you just hit on the controversy right there. Some people say, God, you know, numbers are really hard to remember. Right. Although, Steph Curry is number 30, and Jackie Robinson was number 42. Oh, so we can remember some numbers, right? Yeah. But I do think that, you know, Stacy, Joanne, these are easier than numbers for most people. Um, the, the controversy around names has to do with maybe the preconceptions that it creates. So if a bear, for example, were named Fifi mm -hmm. or Fluffy, you might think of her one way, and if her personality was really different, you know, that, that might pose a problem. It's, it's a fascinating discussion that is occurring within the, the Granger world. So these bears do not wear collars, they do not wear tags, but they are numbered, and you can keep track of them in this wonderful book, uh, the Bears of Brooks River book that the rangers put out every year. It's updated every year. It has general information about Katmai. Oh, and this is free online. A great way to identify your pictures when you get home from the park. Mm -hmm. If you've gone to Katmai and you've taken a lot of pictures and you want to know, gosh, which bear is this that I have all these photos of, check out the Bears of Brooks Falls book. Oh, that is so let me tell you about a few of the bears, and I'll, I'm behind schedule, so I'll try to go pretty quickly. This is Bear 480 Otis. He's one of the most famous and well-known and easily recognizable bears at Brooks Camp. He is the oldest male, male bear to frequent the park. Um, last year when I was there, he was 23 or 24 years old. So when he comes back this year, he will be 25 years old. Whoa. And I always say he's lived a lifetime and a half already, since most male bears at Count Nine live to be about 15. If you, were, if you were to look closely into Otis's mouth 
as Ranger Mo did in this photograph, you would see that Otis is missing this tooth and this tooth. And a lot of his other teeth are quite worn down. So this makes it hard for Otis to bite the head off a salmon. He can still do it, but it takes more effort. But Otis is a very smart and versatile fisher bear. So what he has done is he has developed other techniques for getting fat. And one of the things that he has started doing is that he will, instead of trying to always fish the jacuzzi, he still does fish the jacuzzi sometimes, and he'll fish in the office quite often. But the other thing that he'll do is he'll pull up here behind the jacuzzi when Bear 503 is sitting in the jacuzzi, because he knows that Bear 503 won't mind if he sits behind him. So Bear 503 will bite the head off a fish, and Bear 503 will eat the head and the, the roe and the skin, the fatty parts, but he'll sometimes let the rest of the fish float downstream, where Bear 480 just picks it up. <laughs> and some people think, oh my god, why is 480 Otis taking scraps from Bear 503? And I think Bear 480 is smart. <laughs> he's letting the kid do all the work, and he's getting fat. And now you're thinking, why is Bear 503 sitting in the jacuzzi? Bear 503 is only five and a half years old. Why is he in the jacuzzi? That's where the dominant bear fish is. Where Bear 503 Cub Adult is no ordinary bear. Bear 503 Cub Adult is the Alexander Hamilton of bears. <laughs> he, like Alexander Hamilton, was a, abandoned by his mother. Uh, most cubs at Katmai stay with their moms until they're two and a half years old. Um, this bear was separated from his mother when he was just a year and a half old. Uh, his mother, Bear 402, was being courted by a dominant bear. And uh, so, uh, by, for whatever reasons, 402 became separated from 503. 402, the mother, mated with 856, at which point she wanted nothing to do with her cub. So Bear 503, Cub Adult, was out on his own. And for three weeks, we, wandered, we watched that bear wander around the lower river, getting thinner and thinner every day. At this point, we had not seen, he was only a year and a half old. I had never seen him catch a fish. And we all worried about him because the odds of, you know, what are the odds of a bear making it on his own at, at a year and a half? Um, this is him as a cub. And then one day, during one of the ranger chats, Ranger Mike and Ranger Roy came on and they said, we have something to show you. They said, Ranger Sherry saw Bear 503 Cub Adult with a fish today on one of the trails. And this is a cell phone photo. This is a a, a, a webcam picture of a cell phone photo um, of Bear 503 Cub Adult on the campground trail eating a fish that he had caught himself. Oh. And I remember watching that ranger chat live. I think I was probably at work, sorry. Um, <laughs> and thinking, oh my God, that bear might be okay. So this was late July, um, 2015, I think. But then what happened in August is that, you know, the salmon in August go upstream and the bears follow the salmon upstream. So we had seen Bear 503, we had seen this photo of him catching a fish, but now it's August and where is he going to go and what's going to happen to him? And then in August, one of the bear cam viewers, Calliope Jane, went to Katmai and she went out to Margo Creek and she came back and she, she had pictures and she said, we saw some of the Katmai bears, some of the Brooks Falls bears out at, at Margo Creek. And they said, well, who did you see? And she posted a picture of what looked like Bear 435 Holly and her spring cub, her six-month-old cub, and then another big cub that looked a lot like Bear 503. And so we started to think, wait, did Holly adopt Bear 503? And Ranger Mike was in the comments saying, yeah, bear adoptions hardly ever happen. Don't get your hopes up. Things are not looking good for the cub. He's trying to manage expectations. Um, <laughs> But we waited and waited and waited, and um, then one day in late August or September, we saw Bear 435 Holly swimming up uh, toward the spit, and we saw the head of her own little spring cub with her, and then we saw a second head, oh. a bigger head. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> um, and Ranger Mike did a live Periscope chat, and he said, well, you know, we see three heads, but it's possible that 435 didn't adopt the cub. Why would, a, why would an adult bear adopt a cub? Why would, why would she want to welcome a cub? You know, why would she want to take in another mouth to feed? Um, he said it's possible that 435 Holly is, is tolerating the cub and letting that cub hang around with her. Um, 
And he said, we'll only know if it's an adoption if she starts to share resources with the cub. And at that point, Bear 435 Holly laid down on this bed, and her own sprig cub started nursing, and Bear 503 cub adult started nursing. Oh. I know! <laughs> and what that meant was that uh, Bear 503 at that time, um, he got to, so the next year, Holly was not ready to emancipate her own spring cub. Her own spring cub was a year, was at that point two and a half years old. Cub adult was three and a half years old. So he got, he had two moms, he had a sibling, and bears with siblings do better than individual bears. Um, he had the challenge of, he taught himself how to fish by himself. So he, like Hamilton, he's just like his country. He's young, scrappy, and hungry. He's not throwing away his shot. That bear, um, that bear figured out, out how to get himself adopted. Um, he had two different mothers with very different temperaments, and he had an extra year with a mom. So when he was emancipated, that, that cub was, in my mind, miles ahead where, of where a lot of other cubs are. So he was fishing the jacuzzi. He started fishing the jacuzzi in August when, of his, of his, when he was four and a half years old. Um, and he fishes now the jacuzzi. And they let him get away with it. They do let that him get away with it. He's a very smart bear. He will not try to displace a bear who's you know, more dominant than him. But he will hold his own against bears who, uh, you know, who, who, he's a very big bear. I forgot to say that. He's, he's got great genetics. Um, he's got really long legs, and he's going to be a really big bear. And he's smart. And I believe that, seriously, like Alexander Hamilton, his, his difficult upbringing will serve him well. I think he's going to be king of the falls one day. This is bear 128 Grazer. Um, she's a light-colored bear with pom-pom ears. She was somebody, I always think of her as a tigger. She's, she's, she's really bouncy, you know, and um, she's thin, she's very distinctive looking, and she never had a lot of cred until a couple years ago she showed up with three cubs. And you can see she's got uh, a big blonde cub, a medium colored dark club, cub, and then a tiny blonde cub. And when she showed up with those cubs, um, she became the fiercest and most protective bear mom I have ever seen. She would take on dominant male bears just for looking at her cubs funny. <laughs> and her cubs got a lot of screen time on the cams. She would, like a lot of female bears, 128 Grazer would often park her cubs by the viewing platforms so that she could go fish. She knows that the male bears don't like to approach the viewing platforms. So a lot of the moms will park their cubs at the viewing platforms. And so her cubs got a lot of screen time. And people would always ask about her cubs, especially the small cub, um, because that cub is so tiny. And people would always want to know, is that cub going to be OK? Whoops. Sorry. Musical accompaniment. So the year that I was there, last summer, um, uh, 128 Grazer had just emancipated her cubs. And the, the, the summer that I was there was, this, was the first summer that those cubs were on their own. So one of the questions I was really interested in was, how are those cubs going to fare on their own? Would they be OK? This is Bear 451. Um, and her first litter, she had a litter of three cubs uh, three years ago, I think, four years ago. All of those cubs died in their first year. Um, I think I forgot to say that the cub mortality rate at Katmai, the cub mortality rate is between 50 and 66 oh, percent. Yeah. So one out of every two or two out of every three cubs don't make it to emancipation. And that was true for 451. Yes? Is a litter of three unusual? Well, maybe. Usually you're seeing maybe litters of one or two. This is not the first litter of three. And in fact, Bear 402, who is 503's mom, she's had a couple of litters of four. Um, so, uh, the, so far, so she right now has a litter of four. She had four spring cubs last year, and she, when we last saw her, she had four. She has not successfully emancipated a litter of four to this point, but we hope that she will. Uh, Bear 451 lost her first litter of three. She's the one who I mentioned one cub died of canine adenovirus. She came back two years ago with a litter of three. And when I was there this summer, they were uh, those were yearling cubs. They're, I put them up here because um, they are so adorable. The, the Bear Camp viewers this year were very worried about her because 451 would take these three cubs up to the falls and she would fish at the falls with those big male bears. 
And, and when I got back from Katmai, what I heard was that the bear camp viewers were worried because they thought that these bears were desperately hungry and taking really unnecessary risks or dangerous risks fishing at the falls. What I saw, and you know, this is different people see different things differently. When I saw them fish the falls, I thought they were being very strategic because if you get four bears all together operating as one, that's, it stops being, you know, one 300-pound bear, one 100-pound bear, 75. It starts being like a 600-pound bear. Okay. Yeah. So, but one of the big questions last year was what would happen to bear 451 and her cubs. If you request my slides, you can go to this link and watch a video. Video is not working right now, so I will ask you to join me in imagining the video that I want to show you. This is my final image. It's going to require your imagination. So imagine that you're standing on the lower river platform. Remember that picture of the mountain that we saw in the fall with the fall colors? Mm -hmm. And it's fall, so all the bears are, are feeding on the dead and dying salmon that are, that are floating into the lower river. And you see Dumpling Mountain, and there in front of Dumpling Mountain is Bear 4 Idiotis with his worn out teeth. But he's looking as big as the mountain behind him because it's September. And once again, he has put on just about as much weight as any bear. And he's one of the fattest bears at Katmai National Park. And in September, there in front of Otis, we see a, a teeny tiny bear with big pom-pom blonde ears. And if you look closely, you can see that that bear is in fact 128 Grazer's <laughs> smallest cub, the runt, at the end of her first summer on her own. And she's put on at least 50% of her body weight. And I will tell you that that bear at the end of her first summer now has her own number, which is 902, which I find very emotional because it means that she survived and she's earned a number. And she also has what I hope is an official nickname of Fifi slash Peanut slash <laughs> Um and I, one reason I hope that's her official name is that it would mean that she's one of the smallest independent bears at Brooks Falls with the longest possible name. Oh, wow. <laughs> and there in the video behind Otis and Fifi Peanut Bonsai, we see Bear 451 and her three cubs looking fat and healthy. 